All right. Um, so uh, today we continue with um, the topic that we have started last time. So we continue with uh, direct sums of vector spaces. Okay, and we're going to finish the proof of uh, the theorem that uh, gives several equivalent characterizations of when our space is a direct product of given subspaces. So this was theorem 510. Okay, uh, and I'm going to uh, state the equivalent um, properties uh, one by one and then prove them accordingly, okay? So let me remind, so the situation is that we're given some subspaces, W1 through WK subspaces of a finite dimensional vector space uh, V, okay? Then the following are equivalent. Uh, property A, we have that V, is the direct sum of these subspaces. So W1, direct sum with W2, etc. direct sum with WK. Okay, this is the first. Uh, we have B. So we have that V is the sum of the subspaces. Okay, so the sum overall I from one to K. Uh, and moreover, for any vectors v1 through vk so that uh, the vector vi is uh, an element in the subspace wi for all i between 1 and k okay so then if the sum of these vectors is zero so v1 plus v2 etc plus vk is equal to zero then uh, we have that each vi is already zero. Okay, so vi is equal to zero for all i. All right, so these are the first two claims. Uh, and last time we have finished by proving that A implies B. Okay, so I'm going to do proofs on a separate page. So A implies B, we have already proved last time. Okay. So the next equivalent property, uh, C, it says that each vector V in the space capital V can be uniquely, and it's very important here, uniquely written as a sum of the vectors from the corresponding subspaces. So written as V equal to V1 plus V2, et cetera, plus VK for some vectors VI in uh, the subspace WI, okay? So there's only one choice of these vectors VI so that uh, from the subspaces WI respectively, so that the sum gives us the vector V. So remember that being the sum, uh, just means that uh, there are some vectors like this, but there might be multiple choices of the VIs, right? So what we are saying that uh, in a direct sum, uh, there's only one way of doing it, all right? So uh, so let's prove it. So we will sh we'll show that B implies C now, okay? So B implies C, all right? So we assume B. So B tells us that uh, for any choice of the VIs, if the sum is zero, then each of them is zero, okay? So we're showing that B implies C. So assume that V is an element of the vector V, okay? Now by B, so we're assuming B, by B we know that there exist some vectors V1 through VK, such that VI is an element of the subspace WI, and we have that V is the sum V1 plus V2, et cetera, plus VK, okay? So we can write V as a sum like this. Uh, and the reason for this is this first part of B, right? That V is uh, the sum of the subspaces WI. So we know that there is some choice like this. 
So our task now is to show that there's only one choice of the VIs like this, right? So we must show that this representation is unique. So suppose that we also have that V is equal to W1 plus W2, et cetera, plus WK, okay? For some vectors WI in the subspaces capital WI. So for all i, okay? So suppose we can write v in some other way like this, but then we have, uh, because these are just two ways of writing v, right? So it means the two sums have to be equal. Uh, and then regrouping the elements, we have that v1 minus w1, one, sorry, plus uh, v2 minus w2, plus et cetera, plus v k, minus wk is equal to zero, right? Because these two sums are equal. So just regrouping, we see that uh, the sum of the corresponding differences has to be zero, okay? But we also know that the vector vi minus wi belongs to the subspace wi, right? Because wi is a subspace and we assume that vi is in wi and we also assume that little wi is in the subspace capital wi so then the difference of these two vectors vi and wi is also in the subspace because subspaces are closed under uh, subtraction right so then we have vi minus wi belongs to the subspace double capital wi for all i okay so we have this all right but now we're in the situation to apply b right so hence we have that vi minus wi is equal to zero for all i using uh, the second part of the assumption b, right? So this, uh, so this shows that all these differences are zero, which simply means that vi is equal to wi for all i, right? But this exactly means that there is only one uh, way to, to, to present V as the sum of such vectors. Because we started with two arbitrary presentations, the one given by the VIs, the other given by the WIs, and we have proved that they are the same. Okay, so this shows that C holds. So this concludes the proof that B implies C, okay? All right, so the next property, uh, and I'll return to that page in a second again. So if, if you need more time. So the second property, A, B, C, D, okay, uh, is the following. So assume we have gamma i, an ordered basis for the corresponding subspace, W, i. Then the union of this basis, gamma one through gamma k, is an ordered basis for V, okay? So we can take bases for each subspace separately, put them together, and this gives us a basis for the whole space. All right, so let's prove this. So we show that C implies D, okay? So, for each i between one and k, let uh, gamma i be an ordered basis for the corresponding subspace w i, okay? So assume we're given some basis like this. We also know that v is the sum of the w i, so from one to k, by C, right? So we assume in C. Uh, so it follows that uh, we have that each vector, okay? Uh, well, okay. So it follows first of all that the union of this, so gamma one union gamma K, excuse me, let me fix it, gamma K uh, generates V or spans V, okay? So this is the first observation. Uh, again, why this? Well, because look, each element of 
a fixed subspace Wi uh, can be written as linear combination of the vectors in gamma i because it's a basis for Wi, right? But then we also know that every vector in V is a sum of the vectors from the Wi's. So, uh, so this is how uh, how we get this. Uh, let me see. There's a question. Is there a group me? <laughs> okay. I, I must admit I don't know what group me is, but uh, I encourage all of you yeah, to, to work in groups or discuss. So yeah, definitely uh, you should uh, you should do it if there's interest. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, but let me go back to the proof. So um, so we have uh, that uh, this the union generates V first of all, right? Okay. So what we need to show additionally is that it is actually a basis. So we have to show that the vectors in this union are linearly independent, okay? So to show that the set gamma, the union, is linearly independent, okay, which is the missing ingredient, consider the vector V, let me denote it as Vij, so this is going to be the J's vector of uh, gamma I, okay? So we assume that J goes from one through MI, where MI is just the size of gamma I, so the number of vectors in gamma I, okay? And I ranges from one to K, okay? So I just enumerate all the vectors in my gamma I's in some manner. Uh, so we get this uh, such a presentation, okay? All right, so we have this vi, j, and we need to show that they're all linearly independent, okay? So for this purpose, let ai, j, in f be uh, scalars such that the sum over all ij, aij times vij is equal to zero, okay? So assume we have a linear combination of all these vectors, which uh, which, uh, which 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 is zero. Okay, all right. But then for each i between one and k, we can collect. Uh, we can look at the part of the sum corresponding to uh, to the vectors in this uh, subspace. Okay, so we let w i be the sum. And now only over j from one to m i, we have a i j v i j. Okay, so this is w i. So note that then for each i, we have that w i belongs to the span of gamma i, right? Just because all the vectors here are from uh, gamma i. So the sum belongs, uh, the linear combination of them belongs to the span. And uh, remember that the span is exactly wi, right? Because gamma is a basis for wi. And we also have that w1, so ju I'm just unwinding this sum now, okay? So this sum using the, the wi's that we just defined. So it tells us that w1 plus w2, et cetera, plus wk is exactly this whole sum. So the sum over all ij, aij times vij equals to zero, okay? All right, so we have uh, obtained that uh, the sum of these vectors wi is zero, okay? But also, since we have that uh, zero is an element of each wi, so since zero belongs to wi for each i, okay? We also have that the sum zero plus zero, et cetera, right? So k times is equal to zero, of course, yeah? So just add zero to itself. So why am I writing this? Well, because we want to use the assumption in C, which tells us that there exists a unique way to write every vector, right? But now look, we wrote the vector zero in two different ways. So first we wrote that zero is equal to W1 plus, uh, et cetera, plus WK. 
And we also have written that zero is equal to zero plus zero plus zero, et cetera, right? So this gives us two different ways to represent zero as a sum of vectors from the, from the WIs, okay? So by the uniqueness of the presentation, these two presentations must be the same, right? So uh, we have that uh, by C, Wi is equal to zero for all I, okay? So we get that in fact, all the Wi's are zero by the uniqueness of uh, presentation of the vector zero. Uh, using C, okay? So we have this. And so uh, at this point, we have that zero equals Wi, right? And now let's unwind what Wi was. So this was the sum over all J from one to Mi, Aij, Vij, right? So this is equal to zero for each I. Okay, but remember now that each gamma i is linearly independent, right? It was a basis. So each gamma i is linearly independent. And uh, hence, the only way a linear combination of vectors in gamma i could be zero is if all the coefficients are zero, right? So we get that aij is equal to zero for all i and j. So we have proved that all the coefficients are zero. So the conclusion is that gamma one union gamma two, et cetera, union gamma k is linearly independent. And so it is a basis for v, okay? Because we already know it spans v and now we have demonstrated that it is also linearly independent. All right, so we have uh, this. Uh, so this proves the implication uh, C implies D, okay? So we have one more item, E, okay? So E uh, is like D, but we now say only that there exists a basis of this form, not that every basis of this form. So for each I from one through K, there exists, an ordered basis gamma i gamma i for uh, the subspace w i with uh, gamma one union gamma two etc union gamma k an ordered basis for the whole space v okay all right so look, uh, what's the difference again between D and E? In D we are saying that if I pick any ordered basis gamma I for WI, then the union is an ordered basis for V, okay? In E we are just saying that there exists some choice of gamma I's basis for WI so that the union is a basis for V. So what we see is that D obviously implies E, right? Because uh, assume D, so to get E, I just pick any gamma I basis for W I. By D, we know that the union is a basis for V, right? So this shows that uh, D implies E is uh, immediate just from the statements of these properties. So D implies E uh, is, uh, is obvious, okay? E is just a weaker statement than D, all right. So we have shown all these implications. So of course, to, to what remains is to show that they're all equivalent. We have to close the loop. So it remains to show that E implies uh, A, okay? So if you can do this, then this shows that any two properties on this list are equivalent because you can go from any property to the other property along uh, the sequence of implications that we have proved here. All right, so let's prove that E implies E as well. So, all right, so E tells us that for each I, we have some gamma I, an ordered basis 
for the subspace wi such that the union gamma one union gamma two etc union gamma k is an ordered basis for v okay so we so e guarantees us that there exists some choice of the gamma i's like this okay then uh, in particular we have that v is the span of gamma one union gamma two etc union gamma k right uh, because we know that uh, v every vector in v is a sum of the vectors from the subspaces wi and each of those is in the span of the corresponding gamma i so we get this okay but uh, the span of a union of some sets of vectors is the same thing as the span of gamma one plus the span of gamma two, et cetera, plus the span of gamma K, okay? And uh, this is the direct sum, uh, sorry, the sum, so far just the sum, okay? Wi, I from one, through k okay so this so we observe this first okay so our next task is to prove the condition for this being a direct sum so we have to show some conditions about how the subspaces intersect we have to show that the intersections are trivial okay uh, so for this purpose we fix j uh, some j in the range between one and k, okay, and we suppose that for some vector v in the space non zero, we have that v belongs to the intersection of this subspace Wj and the sum of all the other ones. So the sum over all i not equal to j, w i, okay? So we suppose this towards a contradiction, okay? So here, let me write it towards a contradiction, right? Because to prove A, we have to show that uh, it's impossible. We have to show that in each intersection of this form is in fact uh, only contain containing the zero vector, okay? So assume we have some non-zero vector in uh, this intersection. Then we have that V belongs to WJ, okay, which we know is the span of gamma J. This is on the one hand. And on the other hand, V belongs to the sum overall I not equal to J WI, okay, which is the same as the span of the union of the gamma I overall i not equal to j, okay? So we have these two uh, properties of v, but then it follows that v is a non-trivial linear combination of both the vectors in gamma j and also the union of the gamma i, i different from j, okay? So we have that uh, V is a non-trivial linear combination of both gamma j and the union of the gammas uh, within this is different from j, okay? So it follows that V can be expressed as a linear combination of gamma one union gamma two etc union gamma k in more than one way right because the first way to present it as a linear combination of vectors in this whole union is to just use the vectors from gamma j okay and the other way to do it is to use only the vectors from uh, the other gamma i's so this gives us uh, two different ways to represent the same vector as a linear combination of the vectors in the basis for V, right? But this contradicts that being a basis 
because we know that basis uh okay so contradicting the property of a basis right because we know that uh for a fixed basis the, for each vector in v there is only one way to write it as linear combination of the vectors in the basis for every non-zero vector more precisely okay all right but then this means that uh, this is impossible right so the conclusion is that wj intersection the sum of the wi for i different from j only contains the zero vector okay so this means that a holds so that's exactly what it means to be um, a direct pro uh, direct sum of subspaces so it means it is a sum of subspaces and the intersection of each of them with the sum of the other ones is uh, trivial only contains the zero vector all right okay so we have this bunch of implications uh which now we conclude the proof of the theorem so we have proved the equivalence of all these different properties okay so some of these properties are useful in some situations some are use more useful in some other situations but the moral is that we have this bunch of nice uh, equivalent conditions which characterize when uh the vector space v is a sum there is a, the direct sum of its subspaces w1 through wk all right so okay so th th there is a bunch of things we did so but let's see some application of this theorem okay so we care about diagonalizable operators this theorem allows us to get a nice description of uh, when uh, an operator is di diagonalizable okay so this is theorem 511 so given a vector space v uh, as usual finite dimensional okay and t a linear operator on v okay then we have that t is diagonalizable if and only if v can be written as the direct sum Yeah, so not just the sum, but actually the direct sum of the eigenspaces of T. Okay, so the diagonalizability uh, is equivalent to this nice uh, condition that the whole space can be split as the direct sum of the eigenspaces. Okay, so let's uh, let's prove this. All right, so let lambda one through lambda k be the distinct eigenvalues of t so we know there are finitely many because the space is finite dimensional okay so first suppose that t is diagonalizable all right and let gamma i be an ordered basis for the corresponding eigenspace so for e lambda i okay now we have uh, an important result from 115 a that i want to remind you so recall from 115 a and this is a theorem 5.9 in the book okay so we have that if t is diagonalizable okay then the union gamma one etc gamma k is an ordered basis for t consisting of eigenvalues uh, sorry of eigenvectors i mean consisting uh ordered base oh sorry ordered basis for v first of all yeah the vector space is v here so ordered basis for oops sorry the ordered basis for v consisting of um eigenvectors of t 
Okay, so this we know already that we can pick a basis for each of the eigenspaces and take the union. This gives us uh, a basis for all of V. All right, so we have this, and hence we conclude that V is a direct sum of the subspaces E lambda i by theorem that we just proved, theorem 510 E, right? Remember that the E part uh, says that there exists a choice of uh, the basis gamma i for some subspaces, W i, so in this case, let me just, in this case, we're taking W i to be this space, E lambda i, and apply the theorem 510, okay? So then we conclude that there is a choice of the gamma i, so that the union is a basis for the whole space. All right. So this is one of the conditions, namely uh, condition E. So this means that the whole space is a direct sum of the E lambda i. All right. So now we need to prove the converse. So conversely, suppose that V is a direct sum of uh, the eigenspaces of T, okay? And our task now is to show that then T is diagonalizable. So assume we know it's, uh, already know that it's a direct sum uh, of eigenspaces, okay? So let's say um, E lambda I for I from one through K, okay? So then for each I, we can choose an ordered basis, gamma I for uh, the corresponding subspace E lambda I, okay? So it exists, we, all, we know every finite dimensional space has a basis, all right? So, uh, so find, choose an ordered basis, gamma I of E lambda I, now we use the other characterization. So by theorem 510D, okay, so the D statement on the list of equivalences we just proved, we know that if we pick uh, basis gamma I uh, for each of the subspaces whose direct sum is V, then the union is also a basis, right? So we get that gamma one, union gamma two, et cetera, union gamma K is a basis for V. Because V is the direct sum of these subspaces, right? So we get that uh, this is a basis for V. But of course, this is a basis for V consisting of eigenvectors for T. Okay. So this means that T is diagonalizable because we know that T is diagonalizable if and only if V has a basis consisting of the of its eigenvectors, okay? So you see here, we use that, uh, what was helpful here, so this concludes the proof, what was helpful here that we already know that the properties E and D are equivalent. So for one direction, it was easier to establish E and for the other one, it was easier to use D. Okay, so usually E is the property which is easier to check, and D is a property which actually is more useful when you're trying to, to, to already apply, knowing that it is a sum of the direct, direct sum of subspaces. Okay, so this concludes the proof of the theorem. Now let me see. There's a question. What chapter and section is this? So so uh, there should be five uh, five um, section uh, chapter five and section. Uh, I don't remember on the top of my head, but uh, this should be the section about the invariant subspaces. Okay, it should be it should be in the, the same section because our global topic is uh, invariant subspaces. Okay, so we use eigenspaces. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we use eigenspaces as uh, the main example of invariant subspaces that we already studied in 115A, and uh, 
Now in 115b, we want actually to extend some of the techniques and ideas about eigenspaces to more general invariant subspaces of an operator. Okay. So in particular, okay. So we have this theorem 511. Okay. So in particular, this theorem gives us a way of decomposing V as a direct sum of T invariant subspaces in the case when T is diagonalizable, right? Because again, if T is diagonalizable, we know that eigenspaces for T are T invariant. And so the theorem tells us in particular that the whole space is the direct sum of T invariant subspaces, all right? But this is only assuming that T is diagonalizable. So now we want to understand what happens in general. If T is not general, not necessarily diagonalizable, can we still decompose it in some way as a sum of T invariant subspaces? All right, so that's the next uh, question. And uh, first step towards understanding this is theorem 524, okay? Which tells us at least uh, some information about the characteristic polynomials, okay? So let T be a linear operator on V where V is a finite dimensional vector space, okay? And suppose that uh, V is the direct sum of some subspaces W1 through WK. So where we have that WI is a T invariant subspace of V for each I, okay? So for each I between one and k, all right? And let fi, uh, well, let fi, let me write the variable fi of t be the characteristic polynomial of the whole operator, uh, sorry, of t restricted to wi, okay? So for each of these uh, uh, invariant subspaces wi, uh, we consider, assume we're given a characteristic polynomial for each of them, okay? For each of the smaller pieces. Uh, then we can calculate the characteristic polynomial of the whole uh, linear operator T, okay? So the conclusion is that then uh, we have that F1 of T times F2 of T, et cetera, times Fk of T is the characteristic polynomial of T, of the operator T. All right. So this theorem gives us a recipe how to calculate the characteristic polynomial of a lin linear operator if we know the characteristic polynomials of its restriction to invariant subspaces so that the whole space is the direct sum of them. In this case, we have the simple formula how to reduce calculating the characteristic polynomial for the whole linear operator T from knowing uh, the characteristic polynomials of its restrictions to this uh, invariant subspaces, okay? But it's important here that this is the, V is the direct sum of those. It's not true if we just have some bunch of subspaces, okay? You need to know that the direct sum is the whole space. All right, so let's, uh, let's show this proof, okay? So we are going to argue uh, by induction on K, where K uh, is the number of the subspaces. Okay, so proof is by induction on K. Okay, so first consider the base case when, so we start here with K equal to two. Okay, because if K is equal to one, there is nothing to prove, right? If K is one, it means that W1 is just all of V. And so this is trivial. So the first non-trivial case is when k is equal to two. So let's prove this, okay? So let beta i be an ordered basis for the subspace w i, and we take beta to be the union of beta one and beta two. Yeah, so in this k, k equals two, we only have two subspaces. W1 and W2. 
Okay, but then we know that beta is an ordered basis for V. Okay, how do we know this? We know this by theorem that we just proved, theorem 510D. Okay, we know that uh, the union of the sum basis for the subspaces is also a basis. Uh, let me see, is the base case always the first non-trivial case? Couldn't we just do the trivial case? Well, we could, <laughs> sure, you could start, but then uh, it depends on the problem. You see, sometimes it's possible to start with k equals one. In this case, uh, it's convenient to start with k equals two, because uh, if you just do k equals one, there's nothing to do, but then you still have to do the step for the k plus one, the inductive step. So in this case, it just turns out that this is the uh, the, 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 the more convenient uh, base case. Okay, there's nothing deep about it. Like say, so you can try to start with k plus one, but then it's it won't be very helpful for the induction. Uh, yeah, we will use, of course. Yeah, yeah, we will use k equals two for for the induct for the, for, the, for induction, right? Remember, for induction, it doesn't matter where you start. Like you can start at any position. But the point is that then you have to show that you can go from k to k plus one. But uh, if you start with k equals two, to have this claim for all k, you know, to know that it's true for k, but that we know as we remarked because it's uh, just calls trivially for k equals one. Yeah. So here we just start with k equals two. It, it, there's no harm in it. Okay. So okay. So like I said, the union of the respective bases beta i gives us a basis for v. So let's uh, look at the matrices. So let A be the matrix representing T with respect to beta, okay? And we let BI be the matrix representing T restricted to WI with respect to beta I for I one equal to one or two, okay? So we, so we uh, define all these matrices. Now let us write beta one as the vectors v1 through vm. So in particular, this means that uh, the subspace w1 has dimension m. Let us write beta two as vm plus one through vn, okay? And let us write beta, in this case, the union. So it's going to be v1, et cetera, through vn, okay? So just, we just have these vectors enumerated in some order, all right? So now let's write out the matrix. So we have that the matrix representing T with respect to beta, so this is A, right? By definition, it's just a matrix in which uh, the columns correspond to the coordinate vectors of T applied to the corresponding vector in the basis, okay? So we simply have that this is T of V1, and we look at its coordinates with respect to beta, et cetera. We have T of V uh, N with respect to beta, right? So this is just the definition of the matrix representation of a linear operator with respect to a given basis beta. So let's try to, understand, to collect some information about this matrix to understand it a bit better, okay? And also to understand how it acts. So we have to do a bit of work here. So first let X in V be any vector. All right. So say we have that X is of the form A1 V1 plus et cetera, plus A N V N for some A I in F, right? So since the V1 through V N is a basis, we know that there exists some choice of uh, scalars AI like this, okay? Now let's define a vector X1 in which we are going to collect uh, the coordinates corresponding to uh, W1. So this here we take the sum over all I from one to M AI VI, okay? And this is an element of W1 because remember we want through VM is a basis for W1. And we let x2 be the sum of the remaining um, uh, elements. So this is the sum over all i from m plus one to n ai vi, okay? And this is an element of w2, 
Okay, so we just split x into these two uh, two vectors, x1 and x2. All right. So now let's uh, let's understand uh, how this sum behaves. So if we have that x is an element of w1, then we also have that x2 is equal to x minus x1, right? Because x is just the sum, x1 plus x2. Then this would also belong to w1. Okay? So we would get that x2 belongs to both w1 and w2. Okay, but uh, we know that this intersection is just the zero vector, right? Because remember, we have that V is the sum, or direct sum, sorry, of W1 and W2. That's how we get that this has to be zero. So in this case, we would get that X2 is zero, okay? But this means that AI is equal to zero for all I between M plus one and M, okay? So in the first case, we would have this. And now the other possibility is that X belongs to W2, okay? Then we also have that X1 is equal to X minus X2 now, which in this case uh, is an element of W2. And so we get that x1 belongs to the intersection of w1 with w2. Okay, so again, this is the zero vector. So we have that x1 in this case is equal to zero. And then we would conclude that ai is equal to zero for all i between one and n. Okay, so we have these two possibilities first. So if X is in W1, then we have the, the first, second group of the coefficients are all zero. And if X is in W2, then the second group of the coefficients are all zero. Okay, so, so let's keep these observations in mind. All right, so now as VI is an element of W1 for all I between one and M, and we have that W1 is T invariant, okay? We have in particular that T of VI belongs to W1. Okay, so similarly, uh, we have that T of VI belongs to W2 for all I between M plus one, and n, uh, excuse me, n, yeah? Because in this case, the vi's are all elements of the corresponding subspace, all right? So this allows us to understand the coordinate vectors in this situation, okay? So then for the coordinate vectors, Again, remember, I'm trying to understand the matrix representing T, okay? So the coordinate vectors we have, so let's collect all the information. So for I between one and M, we have that the coordinate vector of TVI with respect to beta is going to be the vector so that we first have T restricted to W I, okay, uh, W1 of VI with respect to beta one. So this is the beginning of this column vector and then we have zeros, okay? So let's be more careful here. So the first M entries are given by the coordinate vector corresponding to D tw1, right? And the remaining n minus m entries are the zeros. And for uh, i between m plus one and n, 
what do we have? So we'll again look at the vector representing TVI with respect to beta. So in this case, we get the opposite picture, right? So we first have a bunch of zeros. And then we have that TW2 of VI with respect to beta 2. Okay, the column corresponding to that. So here zeros correspond to the first M entries, right? And the remaining n minus m entries are given by uh, by the coordinate vector for t w two of vi with respect to beta two. Okay, so the conclusion is that the matrix t and sorry, I, I, I need one minute to finish. Sorry for overstaying. So we get the point is that we get that the matrix representing t is a block matrix. So we get B1, 0, 0, B2. Okay, let's write this as 0 prime, where we have that 0, 0 prime are 0 matrices of appropriate sizes. Okay. And remember, so B1 and B2 are the matrices representing let me go back for a second. This is the matrices representing TWI restricted to beta I, right? See, we get it because this is how we determined how the column vectors look. Uh, and so we get that this is exactly this shape with two blocks, all right? And for blocks, we know how to determine, uh, how to determine the determinant, yeah, for block matrices. So this is the, the whole point of this analysis. So then we get uh, that the characteristic polynomial of uh, the whole operator, capital T, it's given by the determinant of A, matrix representing T with respect to beta, minus T times the identity matrix, all right? And it's given, and here we use that, we just determined that this is a block matrix, right? So using this, so that this is a block matrix. We know that the determinant is given simply by the product of the determinants of the blocks, right? So we get that this is given by the determinant of B1 minus TI times, so let me draw it like this here, times the determinant of B2 minus TI, right? But those are exactly the characteristic polynomials of uh, t restricted to wi. So we have f1 of t times f2 of t. Okay, so this concludes the proof of the base case. So you see, we have to carefully analyze how the matrix representing t looks in this situation. Okay, and uh, but we were able to do it. We were able to show that then it actually splits into two blocks. And we used that the determinant of a block matrix is just the product of the determinants of the blocks. Uh, next time we'll finish the inductive step. So, so far, this is just the base case, uh, K equals two, okay? But this kind of is the main, uh, the main point, it contains the main difficulty. After this, you'll see that the induction is actually not as bad, but this was the main point, okay? So the inductive step is gonna be done next time. Uh, yeah, and thanks everyone, yeah, sorry for taking the, the extra time. So I'll stop, I, I'll stop here. All right, thanks everyone. So I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you either in the office hours or next time.